Hello everyone, welcome back to the final lecture of the first week. So, in the last lecture we were discussing about various empirical laws, so in particular Gibbs law and Heap's law that how the words in the vocabulary are distributed in a corpus. Okay, and we saw that the distribution is not very uniform. There are certain words that are very, very common. So, we saw that roughly 100, 100 words in the vocabulary make for 50 percent of the corpus, that by that I mean that number of tokens. And on the other hand, there are 50 percent of the words in the, in the vocabulary that occur only once. Okay. And we discussed what are the various relationships among the, num the my vocabulary size and the number of tokens that I observe in a corpus and also how they grow with respect to each other and Gibbs law gives, gave me a relation between the frequency and the rank of a word. So, today in this lecture we will start with the basic pre-processing in, in language. So, we will cover the, the basic concepts and what are the challenges that one might face while doing the processing. Okay. So, we are going to the basics of text processing. Okay. So, we will start with the problem of tokenization as the name would suggest. Okay. Remember the name token, token is an individual word in my corpus. So, now what happens when I, I am pre processing the text in given in any language? What I will face is a string of characters, a sequence of characters. Now, I need to identify what are all the different words that are there in this, in this sequence. So, now tokenization is the process by which I convert this string of characters into sequence of various words. So, I am trying to segment it by the various words that I am observing. Okay. So, now before going into what is tokenization, I will just talk about a slightly related problem, sentence segmentation. Okay. So, this you may or may not have to do always and it depends on what is your application. So, for example, suppose you are doing classification for the whole document into certain classes. You might not have to go to the individual sentence and you can just talk about what are various words that are present in, in this document. On the other hand, suppose you are trying to find out what are the important sentences in this document, in that application you will have to go to the individual sentence. So, now if you have to go to the individual se sentence, the first task that you will face is how do I segment this whole document into a sequence of sentences. Okay. So, this is sentence 1, sentence 2 and so on and this task is called sentence segmentation. So, now you might feel that this is very trivial task, but let us see is it trivial. Okay. So, what is sentence segmentation? So, the problem of deciding where my sentence begins and ends, so that I have a complete unit of words that, that I call as a sentence. Now, do you think there might be certain challenges involved? Suppose I am talking about the language English, can I always say that wherever I have a dot, it is the end of the sentence? Let us see. So, there are many ways in which I can end my sentence. So, I can have exclamation or question mark that ends the sentence and they are mostly unambiguous. So, whenever I have an exclamation or question mark, I can say probably this is the end of the sentence but is the case the same with a dot? So, can you think of a scenario where I have a dot in English and but it is not the end of the sentence? So, you can find all sorts of abbreviations, right? they end with a period like doctor, mister, mph. Okay? So, you have three dots here. So, you cannot call each of the, this as the end of your sentence. So, again you have numbers. 2.4, 4.3 and so on. So, that means the problem of deciding whether a particular dot is the end of the sentence or not is not entirely trivial. So, I need to build certain algorithm for finding out is it my end of the sentence. Okay. So, in, in text processing we, we face this kind of problem in nearly every, every simple every simple task that we are doing. Okay. So, even if it looks a trivial task we face with this problem. Okay, can I always call dot as the end of the sentence? So, how do we go about solving this? Now, if you think about it, whenever I see a dot or question mark or exclamation, I always have to decide one of the two things. Is it the end of the sentence 
or is it not the end of the sentence okay so any data point that i am seeing i have to divide into one of these two classes okay so if you call, think of these as two classes end of the sentence or not end of the sentence so each point you have to divide into one of the two classes and this in general this problem in general is called classification problem okay so you are classifying into one of the two classes now so the idea is very very si simple so you have two classes and each data point you have to divide into one of the two classes so that means you have to build some sort of rule or algorithm for doing that so in this case i have to build a binary classifier what do i mean by a binary classifier there are two classes end of the sentence or not end of the sentence in general there can be multiple classes so now for each dot or in general for every word i need to decide whether this is the end of the sentence or not the end of the sentence so in general my classification classifiers that i will build can be some rules that i write by hand okay some simple if then else rules or it can be some expressions i say if my particular example matches with this particular expression it is one class if it doesn't match it is another class or i can build a machine learning classifier so in this particular scenario what can be the simplest thing to do let us see can we build a simple rule based classifier so so we'll we'll start with the example of a simple decision tree so by decision tree i mean a set of if then else statements okay so i am at a particular word i want to decide whether this is the end of the sentence or not okay okay so i can have this simple if then else kind of decision tree here so i am at a word and i the first thing i check is are there lots of blank lines after me so this would happen in a text whenever this is the end of the a paragraph and there are some blank lines so if you, i feel that there are a lot of blank lines after after me that means after this word i may say okay this might be the end of the sentence with a good confidence so that's why the branch here says yes this is the end of the sentence but suppose there are not a lot of blank, blank lines then i will check if the final punctuation is a question mark or exclamation or a colon in that case okay so they are quite unambiguous i will say this is the end of the sentence now suppose it is not then i will check if the final punctuation is a period so if it is a period if it is not a period this is easy, easy to say that this is not the end of the sentence but suppose this is end of, this is a period so again i cannot say for certain if it is the end of the sentence so i will again check for simplicity i might have a list of abbreviations and i can check if the word that i am currently facing is one of the abbreviations in my list if it is there i will say okay this is not end of the sentence if it is so here i am etc or any other abbreviation if the answer is yes i am not end of the sentence if the answer is no that means this word is not an abbreviation and this will be the end of the sentence so this is very very simple if then else rule, rules okay this may not be correct but this is one particular uh, way in which this problem can be solved in general you might want to use some other sort of indications we call them as various features they are various observations that you make from your corpus okay so what are some examples okay so suppose i see the word that is ending with dot can i use this as a feature whether my word starts with an upper case lower case cap all caps or just a number okay how will that help so let us see i have here i am here and my word is 4.3 so i am at dot i want to find out if it is the end of the sentence if i can say that the previous the, the current word is a number it's a high probability that this will be in number and it will not be the end of the sentence so this can be used as another feature okay so again by feature you can think of a simple rule whether the word i am currently at is a number okay or i can use the fact where the case of the word with dot is upper case or lower case so you so what happens generally in abbreviations they are mostly in upper case so suppose i have doctor and it starts with an upper case okay i can say that this might be an abbreviation 
okay same with lower case lower case will give me more probability that this is not an abbreviation similarly i can also use the case of the word after dot okay so is it upper case lower case capital or number so how will that help so again whenever i have the end of the sentence the next word in general starts with a capital so again this can be used what can be some other features so i can have some numerical features so that is i will have certain thresholds so what is the length of the word ending with dot is it if the length is small it might be an abbreviation if the length is larger it might not be an abbreviation okay and i can also use probably the what is the probability that the word that is ending with dot occurs at the end of the sentence okay so if it is really the end of the sentence it might happen in that in a large corpus this end sentence quite often same thing i i can do with the next word after dot is it the start of the sentence what is the probability that it occurs in the start of the sentence in a large corpus okay so you might be able to use any of these features to decide given a particular word is it the end of the sentence or not okay so now suppose i ask you this question do you have the same problem in other languages like hindi so in hindi you will see that in general there is only a danda that you use to indicate the end of the sentence and this is not used for any other purpose so this problem you will see is again language de dependent this problem is there for english but not so for hindi but we will see there are other problems that do not exist for english language but are there for other indian languages okay we will see some of those examples in the same lecture okay now so how do we implement it recently so as you have seen this is a simple if then else statement okay so now what is important is that you choose the correct set of features so how do you go about choosing the set of features you will see in your from your data what are some observations that can separate my two classes here so my two classes here are end of the sentence and not the end of the sentence and what are the observations we were having okay in general it might be an abbreviation the case of the word uh, and that it before the dot maybe upper case or lower case and one of these might indicate one class other might indicate other class so all these are my observations that i use as my features now whenever i am using a numerical features like the length of the word before dot i need to pick some sort of threshold okay that is whether the length of the word is between 2 to 3 or say more than 3 between 5 to 7 like that so my tree can be if the length of the word is between 5 to 7 i go to one class otherwise i go to another class okay so now here is one problem suppose i keep on increasing my features this can be both uh, numerical or non numerical features it might be difficult to set up my if then else rules by hand so in that scenario i can try to use some sort of machine learning technique to learn this decision tree okay in in the literature there are a lot of such uh, algorithms that are available that given a data and a set of features will construct a decision tree for you okay so i'll just give you so the names of some of the algorithms and the basic idea on which they work is that so at every point you have to choose a particular split okay so you have to choose a feature value that splits my data into certain parts and i have certain criteria to find out what is the best split so one particular criteria is what is the information gain by this okay so these algorithms that we have mentioned here like id3 c415 and cart they all use one of these criteria okay in general once you have identify what are your interesting features for this task you are not limited to only one classifier like decision tree you can also try out some other classifiers like support vector machines logistic regression and neural networks okay all these are quite popular classifiers for various nlp applications so we will talk about some of these as we will go to some some advanced topics in this course okay now coming back to our problem of tokenization okay we said that tokenization is a process of segmenting a string of 
characters into words, finding out what are the different words in this history. Now, remember we talked about token and type distinction. So, suppose I give you a simple sentence here, I have a can opener, but I can't open these cans. How many tokens are there? If you count, there are 11 different words, 11 different occurrences of words. So, you have 11 word tokens, but how many unique words are there? So, you will find there are only 10 unique words, okay, which word repeats here, so the word I repeats twice. So, there are 10 types and 11 tokens. So, my tokenization is to find out each of the 11 word tokens from this sentence. Okay. In practice, at least for English, you can use certain toolkits that are available like NLTK in Python, Core NLP in Java and you can, you can also use some Unix commands. So, in this course, we will mainly be using NLTK toolkit for doing all this pre-processing task and some other uh, tasks as well. Okay, but in general, you can use any of these three uh, possibilities. So, for English, most of the, the, the problems that we will see are taken care of by the tokenizers that we have discussed previously. Okay. But still, it is good to know what are the challenges that are involved when I, have, I try to design a tokenization algorithm. Okay. So, for example, here you will see that I, if I encounter a word like fill lands in my data, so one question that I have is whether I treat it as simple fill land, as it is fill lands, or I, I convert it to fill lands by removing the apostrophe. Okay. So, this question you might also try to defer to the next processing step that we will see but sometimes you might want to tackle this in the same step. Okay. Similarly, if you see what are, do I treat it as a single token or two tokens, what are? This problem you might have to solve in the same step, whether I treat it as a single token or multiple tokens. Same with I am, should not, shouldn't and so on. Similarly, whenever you have named entities like San Francisco, should I treat it as a single token or two separate tokens? Now, remember when we were talking about some of the cases why NLP is hard. So, you might have to find out that this particular sequence of tokens is a single entity and treat it as a single entity, not as multiple different tokens. Okay. So, this problem is related. Similarly, if you find m.p.h, do you call it a single token or multiple tokens? So, now there are no fixed answers to, to these and some of these might depend on what is the application for which you are doing this pre-processing. Okay. But one thing you can always keep in mind, suppose you are doing it for the application of information retrieval, the same sort of steps that you apply for your documents should be applied to your query as well, otherwise you will not be able to match them perfectly. Okay. So, suppose if I am using it for information retrieval, so I should use the same convention for both my documents as well as the query. Okay. So, then another problem can be, how do I handle hyphens in my data? Okay. So, this looks again a simple problem, but we, we will see it is not that simple. So, let us see some kind of examples. What are the various sorts of hyphens that can be there in my corpus? So, here I have a sentence from a research paper abstract and the sentence says, this paper describes mimic an adaptive mixed initiative, a spoken dialogue system that provides movie showtime information. Okay. So, in this sentence itself, you see two different hyphens. One is with initiative, initiative, another is show hyphen time. Okay. So, now can you see that these two are different hyphens? The first hyphen is not in general that I will I will use in, in my text. Okay. Second hyphen I can use in my text, I can write show time with a hyphen, but how did this hyphen initiative came into the corpus? Okay. So, so, we have given this a title end of line hyphen. So, what happens in research papers for example, whenever you write a sentence, you might have to do some sort of justification and that is where you end the line even if it is not the end of the, of the word. So, you will end up with a hyphen. Okay. So, now when you are trying to pre-process and when you are retrieving such kind of hyphens, you might have to join these together and you say you have to say that this is a single word initiative and not initiate hyphen tail. Okay. But again, this is this is not trivial because for showtime you will not do the same. Showtime you might want to keep it as it is. Then there are some other kind of hyphens like lexical hyphens. 
So you might have beach hyphens with uh, various prefixes like co, pre, meta, multi, etc. Sometimes they are sententially determined hyphen, hyphens also. That is, you put hyphens so that it becomes easier to interpret the sentence. Like here, case paste, hand delivered, etc., are optional. Similarly, if you see in the next sentence, three to five year direct ma marketing plan. Okay, three to five year can be written perfectly without keeping the hyphens, but here you are putting it so that it becomes easier to interpret that particular occurrence. So again, when you are doing tokenization, your problem that how do I handle all these hyphens? Further, there are various issues that might that you might face for certain languages, but not others. So for an example is like in French, if you have a token like l'ensemble, so you might want to match it with a ensemble. Okay. So that might be a similar problem that we are facing in English, but let us take something in German. Okay. So I have this I have this big sentence here. Okay. But the problem is that this is not a single word. This is a compound composed of four different words and the corresponding English meaning is this one. So you have four words in, in English, so when you are putting in, in French, they make a compound. So now, what is the problem that you will face when you are processing the, a German text and you are trying to tokenize it? So you might want to find out what are the individual uh, words in this particular compound. So you need some sort of compound splitter for German. Okay, so this problem is there for German, not so much for English. Okay, so now what happens if I am taking a language like Chinese or Japanese? Okay, so here is a sentence in Chinese. So what do you see in Chinese words are written without any spaces in between? Okay. So now, when you are doing the pre-processing, your task is to find out what are the individual word tokens in this Chinese sentence. So, this problem is also difficult because in general, for a given utterance of a sequence of characters, there might be more than one possible way of breaking it into sequence of words and both might be perfectly valid possibilities. Okay. So in Chinese, we do not have any space between words and have to find out what are the places where I have to break these uh, words and this problem is called tokenization, word tokenization. Same problem happens with Japanese and you have further complications because they are using four different scripts like katakana, hiragana, kanji and romanji. So this problem becomes a bit more severe. Now the same problem is there even for Sanskrit. Okay. So if some of you have taken a Sanskrit course in in your class 8th or 10th. So you might be familiar with the, the rules of Sandhya in, in, in Sanskrit language. Okay. So let us say that this is a simple single sentence in Sanskrit, but this is a huge, this looks like a sim single word, but it is not a single word. It is composed of multiple words in Sanskrit and they are combined with a Sandhya relation. Okay. And this is, stands for a pro proverb, in, nice proverb in Sanskrit that translates in English as one should tell the truth one should say kind words, one should neither tell harsh truths nor flattering lies. This is a rule for all times. This is a, this is a proverb. And this is a single sentence that talks about this proverb, but where all the words are combined with Sandhi relation. So if you try to undo the Sandhi, this is what you will find at the segmented text. Okay? So there are multiple words in this, in this sentence. They are combined to make a, make a single, it looks like a single word. Now, so this problem we saw in Chinese, Japanese and Sanskrit, but in Sanskrit the problem is slightly more complicated and why is that? So in, in Japanese and, and in Chinese, when you try to combine various words together, you simply concatenate them. You put them one after another without, without making any changes at the boundary. It does not happen in Sanskrit. When you combine two words, you also make certain changes at the boundary and this is called the Sandhi operation. Okay. So in this particular case, so you see here I have 
the word bruyat and the word na, but when I am combining, I am I am writing it bruyanna. So you see here the 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 letter t gets changed to n. Okay, so that means when I am trying to analyze the sentence, so this particular sentence in Sanskrit, I need to find out not only what are the breaks, but what is the corresponding word from which this sentence is derived. So, from here I have to find out that the, the actual words are bruyat plus na that gives give me this bruyana and this is very very common in Sanskrit that you are always combining words by doing a sandhi operation. So, this further complicates my problem of word, seg word tokenization or segmentation. Also. So, this is just a list from Wikipedia, what are the longest words in various languages, okay, not the sentences, but the words. So, you see in Sanskrit, the longest word is composed of 431 characters, it is a compound and then you have Greek and Afrikaans and, and other languages. In English, you see the, the longest word is of 45 characters, this is non-scientific. So, what is the, the particular word in, in Sanskrit that is composed of 431 letters? So, this was from the Vardambika Parinaya Champu by Thiru, Thirumalamba. Okay, this is a single compound from his from his book. Okay. So now, when I talk about this problem of tokenization in Sanskrit or in English, this problem is also called word segmentation. I have a sequence of characters, I need to segment it to find out individual words. Now, what is the simplest algorithm that you can think of? Let us say the case of Chinese. Okay. So, the simplest algorithm that works is a greedy algorithm that is called maximum matching algorithm. So, whenever you are given a string, you start your pointer at the beginning of the string. Now, so suppose that you have the dictionary and the words that you have that you are currently seeing all should be in the in the dictionary. So, you will find out what is the maximum match as per my dictionary in the string. You break there and put the pointer from at the next character and again do the same thing. So, so, this greedily chooses what are the actual words by taking the maximum matches and this works nicely for most of the cases. Okay. Now, so, so this is a related question. Now, can you think of some cases where the segmentation will also be required for English text? In English, in general, we do not combine words to make a single single word. Okay, We do not do that, but what is the scenario where we, we are doing that right now? Okay. So, does do hashtags come into mind? So, for example, suppose I have hashtags like thank you Sachin and music Monday. So, here different words are combined together without putting a boundary in between. So, if you are given a hashtag and you have to analyze that, you have to actually segment it into various words. Okay. Now, so when I talk about Sanskrit, so, so, so this we have a segment available at the site sanskrit.india.fr. So, we will just briefly see what is the design principle of building a segmenter in Sanskrit. So, first we have a generative model that says how do I generate a sentence in Sanskrit? I have a finite alphabet sigma, okay, that means a set of various characters in Sanskrit. Now, from this finite alphabet I can generate a lot of words okay, that are composed of various number of uh, phonemes or, or letters from this alphabet. Now, when I have a set of words, I can now combine them together with an operation of sandhi. That is what I mean by sigma star he here. Okay. So, w star here. So, I have a set of words w and I do a clean closure. That means, I can combine any number of words together, but whenever I am combining words, I am doing them by a sandhi operation. Okay. That is the relation between the words. So, so I have my set of inflected words also called padaj in, in Sanskrit and I have the relation of sandhi between them and that is how I generate sentences. But my problem is how do I analyze them? So, that is the inverse problem. That is whenever I am given a sentence w, I have to analyze it by inverting the relations of sandhi, so that I can produce a finite set of word forms w 1 to w n. Okay. And I am saying together with the proof, so that is a formal uh, way of saying that, but what I mean is that w 1 to w n when I, they combine by sandhi operation, they give me the actual sentence, the initial sentence. Okay. So, that is how the segmenter is, segmenter is built. Now, this is a, a snapshot from, from the segmenter. So, I gave the same sentence there 
and and it gave me all the possible ways of analyzing the sentence and it, it says that there are 120 different solutions okay so here whenever i have brianna so you see there are two possibilities bruyat and bruyam plus na okay like that it gives me all the possible ways in which the sentence can be broken into individual word tokens now this is another problem that i will have to find out what is the most likely word sequence among all these 120 possibilities but we can use many many different models that we will not talk, talk about in this lecture probably in some some other lectures okay so coming back to normalization so so we talked about this problem that the same word might be written in multiple different ways like u dot s dot a versus usa now i should be able to match them together okay especially if you are doing information retrieval you are giving a query and you are retrieving from some document suppose your query contains u dot s dot a and the document contains usa if you are only doing the surface level match you will not be able to map them to each other so that so so you will have to consider this problem in advance and do the pre processing accordingly of either your documents or the query but using the same sort same settings so what i what we are doing by this we are defining some sort of equivalence class h we are saying usa and u dot s dot a should go to one class and they are the same type we also do some sort of case folding that is we can reduce all letters to lower case so whenever i have the word like uh, w o r d i will always write small w o r d so that whenever even if it is starting the sentence and it occurs in capitals because of that in general i know that this is a word word w o r d but this is not a generic rule sometimes depending on application you might have certain exceptions for example you might have to treat the name entity separately so if you have a entity general modus you might want to keep it as it is without case folding similarly you might want to keep us for united states in upper case and not do the case folding and this is important for the application of machine translation also because if you do a case folding here you will know us in lower case that means something else versus us that is in united states excuse me we also have the problem of lambdaization that is you have individual individual words like m r h and you want to convert them to their lemma that means what is the base form from which they are derived similarly car cars 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 so all these are derived from car so again this is some sort of normalization you are saying all these are some sort of equivalence class because they come from the same word form so in the the problem of lambdaization is that you have to find out the actual dictionary head word from which they are derived okay and for that we use morphology okay so what is morphology i am trying to find out the structure of a word by seeing what is the particular stem the head word and what is the affix that i apply to it okay so these individual units are called various morphemes okay so so you have stems that are the dictionary head words and the affixes that are what are the different units like as for plural etc you are applying to them to make the individual word okay some examples are like for prefix you have un anti etc for english and ati pra etc for hindi or sanskrit suffix like it asian etc and ta ka k etc for hindi and in general you can also have some infix like you have a word like with and you can fix an in between this is in sanskrit so we'll discuss in detail about it in morphology later so so there is another concept you have lambdaization where you are finding the actual dictionary head word so there is also concept called stemming where you do not try to find the actual dictionary head word but you just try to remove certain uh, suffixes okay and you op, whatever you obtain is called a stem so this is a crude chopping of various suffixes in the, in that word okay so this is again language dependent so what we are doing here words like automate automatic automation all will be reduced to a single uh, lemma automate here so this is stemming so you know the actual lemma is 
automate with an E. But here, so I am just chopping off the affixes at the end. So I am removing here this IC, ION, all and putting it to automate. Okay. So this is one example. So if you try to do a stemming here, so you will find from example E is removed from compressed E D is removed and so on. So what is the algorithm that is used for for this stemming? So we have the Porter's algorithm that is very very famous, and this is again some set of if then else rules. Okay. So what are some examples here? So what is the first step? I take a word if it ends with S S E S. I remove E S from there and I end with S S. So example is caresses goes to caress. If not, then I see whether the word ends with I E S, I put it to I, like ponies goes to pony. Okay. If not, I see if the word ends with S S, I keep it as S S. If not, I see if the word ends with S, I remove that S. Okay. So cats goes, goes to cat, but caress does not go to caress with only one s because this step comes before if there is a double s ending the word i re i retain it otherwise if there is a single s i remove that like that there are some other steps so if there is a vowel in the send in the in my word and the word ends with ing i remove ing so walking goes to walk but what about king you see in in k there is no vowel so king will be retained as it is same there is a vowel and there is an ed, I remove the cd and I have this word plate to play. So you can see that wo what is the use of this heuristic of having this vowel. If you did not have this vowel, you would have converted king to k. Okay. And like that there are some other rules like if the word ends with ational, then I put it put ate, so rational, so relational to relate and if the words end with, word ends with izdr. I can I remove that R digitize to digitize, ATOR to ATE, and if the word ends with AL, I remove that AL. If the word ends with ABLE, I remove that ABLE. If the words end with ATE, I remove that ATE. Okay. So like that, these are some steps that I take from my corpus for each word. I I convert it to its stem. Okay. It does not give me the correct dictionary head word, but still this this is a good practice in principle for information retrieval. Okay, if you want to match the query with the documents. So this is for this week. So next week we will start with another pre-processing task that is spelling correction. Okay. Thank you.